A very good morning, ladies and gentlemen, and thank you very much for joining us for what I'm sure is going to be a most humorous talk this morning from the one and only. Ladies and gentlemen, please help me welcome back for the final time, and please help me for his contributions throughout the cruise as we welcome back Mr. Sam Hall. Good morning, everybody, and thank you so much for being here. Uh, today I'm going to be speaking about journalism, which, as you may know, is the third oldest profession in the world, <laughs> after, uh, after prostitution and politics. <laughs> and uh, as uh, Ronald Reagan once said, there's not a great deal of difference between the three. <laughs> Dean Atchison, the former American Secretary of State, uh, once defined an editor as somebody who <laughs> sorts out the wheat from the chaff and then publishes the chaff. <laughs> well, we had an ITN newscaster who, at the end of News at 10, um, was given a piece of paper, and he looked down, and then he looked back at the camera, and he said, uh, we have a late football result, Division 1, Arsenal 2. Good night. <laughs> I, I mention that because uh, people often say, well, anybody could read the news, you could stick a monkey up there, you could do just as well. It's not true. Actually, it's going live on television is a very scary, dangerous job uh, because it's an excellent way of uh, making absolutely sure that you make a complete idiot of yourself in front of millions of people. Uh, Reggie Bowson, can you remember him? Yeah. Oh, yes. He was reporting live from an air show and uh, he, was, he went up to a mechanic who was tinkering with the undercarriage of an aeroplane. He said, uh, could this plane be capable of getting back to the airfield on one engine? And uh, the mechanic said, well, I don't see why not. And Reggie said, why is that? And he said, well, because that's all it's got. <laughs> My favorite story, which I've told to a few people at dinner, so apologies for that, but uh, is when Reggie, his wife uh, had left him, his wife Felicity had left him. He went to live with his sister who lived in an apartment overlooking the King's Road in London. And she had a little balcony, and for some weird reason, Reggie got it into his head that he wanted to grow some tomatoes. So he uh, went out and he, 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 he bought a couple of grow bags, but he cut them open and dutifully watered them for about five, six weeks. Uh, but nothing really happened, and he expressed his disappointment that these tomatoes hadn't flourished. And his sister commiserated with him, and then she had a second thought, and she said, Reggie, you did actually plant some tomatoes, did you? Uh, and of course he hadn't, you see, because he'd seen a picture of tomatoes on the cover of this thing, and thought that they'd just uh, pop up. Uh, Reggie was a wonderful colleague, he was very kind, he was extremely uh, generous, he was witty, he was full of fun. Uh, I sat next to him for four years, and I have to tell you, I never once saw him drunk. That became a sort of legend in a way, but he'd had polio as a child, and it caused his mouth to droop, and occasionally he'd slur a word or two. And uh, Private Eye got hold of that, and of course that then became fake news, as we call it today. Uh, he was a man, man of tremendous warmth, and above all, he cared about his audience, about the job, his colleagues, and above all else, about the news. Um, and in his early days, uh, as a reporter, he was an occasional war correspondent. And he was very nearly shot in the Congo. Uh, a local man had been driving him and the camera crew um, along a dirt road, and they came to a roadblock that was manned by three armed gentlemen who were also drunk and therefore very dangerous. And one of them spoke to the driver and he said them at some length, and Reggie said, what's he saying, what's he saying? And the driver said, well, he says he's going to shoot you. Um, so thinking quickly, uh, Reggie reached inside his pocket and pulled out a letter. And he said, here, we'll show him this. It's, uh, it's uh, to uh, President Trump, and it's about the interview that we're going to be doing with him. It's an official letter. And uh, this letter was passed on to the driver, and then the driver passed it on to this fellow. And Reggie, understandably, was quite terrified. And um, the soldier, he noticed then that the soldier was holding the letter sideways. So he's probably thinking he was Arabic or something. And uh, so he then thought, well, everything's going to be okay, and he's not going to realize that it was a letter he's actually just written to his wife. <laughs> um, anyway, the soldier signaled to uh, his colleagues to lift the boom, and uh, once again spoke to the driver at some length, and again, Reggie got very nervous, and he said, well, what's he saying now? What's going on? And the driver said, well, he said, it's okay, we can go through. He said, he'll shoot you on the way back. <laughs> 
Reggie was uh, an extremely witty man. Uh, he could also be an absolute devil. And on the day the Queen opened uh, ITN's new headquarters at Wells Street, just off uh, Oxford Street in London, his fellow newscaster, Andrew Gardner, uh, Gardner, was at his usual seat with Reggie, sitting opposite to uh, as the royal entourage approached. And Andrew had in his typewriter a pro forma for the News at 10 headlines, which we called the bombs, because we would wedge the headline in between the bombs or the chimes of Big Ben. And when, as the Queen approached, Andrew had not yet typed in the main headline. And uh, he was waiting right until the last minute in case there was a late-breaking story, which there very often was. And suddenly, with the Queen no more than about six or eight feet away, Reggie leapt out of his seat, elbowed Andrew out of the way, and frenetically typed in a headline. And then stood respectfully to one side, just as uh, Sir Nigel Ryan, the editor, Sir David Nicholas, the news editor, um, and the Queen reached the desk. At that precise moment, Andrew happened to see what Reggie had typed. And with horror, he wound the pro forma back into the typewriter so that nobody would see it. But like a flash, uh, he, he then stood up, and after the usual niceties, uh, Sir David Nicholas, who spotted the piece of paper in the uh, typewriter, said, um, Andrew, he said, I'm sure Her Majesty would be very uh, pleased and interested to know how you're getting on with the headlines. Well, you can almost feel the chill going down in that back. In fact, Andrew told me later that he could feel the perspiration dripping down the back of his neck. And he fixed uh, David Nicholas with a laser-like stare that was intended to be lethal. And uh, he said, no, I don't think so, we haven't got any. Well, David Nicholas was a newsman. And he said, oh, come on, Andrew. He said, uh, you must have something. And whipped the piece of paper out of the typewriter. And in one fluid moment, uh, movement, crumpled it up and threw it in the bin. He said, hmm, see what you mean. <laughs> well, you want to know what Reggie wrote, don't you? <laughs> yes, well, he said, um, Bong, one old queen meets another. 